in just 10 minutes. Let's dive into Web3PY and understand how to execute a swap on Uniswap, monitor transactions that involve a specific address, and retrieve historical contract event logs. So as I mentioned in the previous Bite Size Building video, I've started using Python a little bit more throughout the past few weeks. And because of this, I've been spending more time in various Python-oriented EVM developer communities. And throughout my time within these communities, I frequently hear about the same few tasks that people seem to struggle with. But once you gain a solid grasp on Web3PY as a library, how it's structured, syntax, etc. Tasks like these become a lot more approachable. So in just 10 minutes, we're going to dive into three key tasks within Web3PY to help you better understand how to utilize the library as a whole. So let's jump right into it. We're going to make three different scripts. The first script will execute a swap transaction on Uniswap. The second script will monitor transactions that occur to and from an address. And then the third and final script that we write will retrieve transfer events for USDT on mainnet Ethereum within a specified block range. So as you can probably tell, this will be one of the more involved bite size building videos. So stick with me here. We're gonna to try to go through each of these as fast as possible without missing any major details. Okay, so to start, we'll need two base libraries, one of which will be optional. First, we'll need Web3. Of course, this will act as our base connectivity layer with the blockchain and will allow us to interact with the contract and execute the transaction. And we'll also need OS to handle the environment variable for our private key. Okay, so now with Web3 and OS imported, we'll need to actually connect to the blockchain. In this case, it'll be the Go Early testnet. We can do this by defining a variable called W3 or Web3, whichever one you prefer. We'll set this equal to Web3 and then Web3 dot HTTP provider. And now we'll need an RPC URL for the HTTP provider constructor. So let's go ahead and quickly launch a chains.go early node. I'm here on the chains.console. I'll head into this project here, test three. I'll click join network, select Ethereum, and then Ethereum go early testnet. This will be an elastic full node and I'll deploy it in Frankfurt on Virtuoso. Now we can go ahead and click on join network. And then we can open it up here, scroll down and copy our HTTPS endpoint. And then we can go ahead and paste that in here. Okay, so now that we're connected to Go Early, we're going to need to define a few base variables. We'll first need to define address. This will be the address of the wallet executing the swap. We'll also need to define a variable called wrapped ETH. This will be the address of the wrapped ETH contract. We'll now need to define the token to buy variable. Simply put, this variable contains the address of the token that we want to swap to. In this case, this is the contract address of the Uniswap token. Okay, so now that we're connected to the blockchain and we have all of our base variables, we'll need to define our contract object, which essentially means that we'll be loading the Uniswap v2 router. To do this, we'll first need to import the router ABI. We can save this in a variable called router ABI. And then right here on Etherscan, we have the v2 router contract. So to get the ABI, we'll need to head down to contract and then copy the contract ABI here. And then of course, we'll also need to define our router address. We can save this in a variable called router address and set that equal to the address of the router contract here. We can define the contract object itself. Let's save this in a variable called router and we can call w3.eth.contract. And in here, we can set address equal to router address and ABI equal to router ABI. We've now defined all of our base variables as well as initialize the router object. So now we can start building the transaction itself. To do that, let's first define a call to the swap ETH for tokens method. We can save this in a variable called swap and set that equal to router.functions.swap exact ETH for tokens. And then in here, we'll need to define a few parameters of our swap. We can start with zero to define the minimum amount out. Now we'll need a list here with the wrapped ETH address, as well as the token to buy address. Now we can pass in my address or the address that'll be executing the swap. And then finally, we can define the deadline, which will just be this number here. The next thing we can do is estimate the amount of gas that the swap will take. We can save this in a variable called estimate and set that equal to swap estimate gas. And then in here, we can pass some simple parameters like from address, as well as the value, which in this case will be W3 dot two way 0 0.001 and that'll be converted from ether so now let's define the transaction we can call this transaction equals swap dot build transaction then we can pass in some basic transaction parameters like from value which will be the same value that we defined in the estimate variable we can define the gas which will be set equal to estimate we can define the gas price which will be equal to w3 dot eth dot gas price we can also define the nonce this will just simply be the transaction count of the address that'll execute the swap. And then finally, we can define the chain ID, which in this case will just be set to five because we're on go early. So now we've loaded the router contract, defined our swap variable, defined the gas estimation, and built the transaction. So now all we'll need to do is sign the transaction and then push it to the network. We can do this in a variable called signed tx, then w3.eth dot account dot sign transaction. Then we can pass in the transaction object as well as our private key. And now we can simply push the transaction to the network with send raw transaction. We can save this in a variable called tx hash and do w3.eth.send raw transaction and pass in signed tx.raw transaction. 
And then we can just go ahead and print out the transaction hash. All right, so now we can go ahead and run it and see if it works. And there we go. Looks like the transaction went through and we have the transaction hash. We can see 0 0.001 wrapped ETH, 4.02 Uniswap tokens. All right, hopefully you're hanging in there. We're gonna move on to the second script now and go through the process of monitoring transactions that are either sent to or from a specific address. Let's start by importing our only base library. Of course, that'll be Web3. We can now connect to the Ethereum blockchain. We can again define W3 and then Web3 WebSocket provider. Then in here, we can go back to the node that we created earlier and use the the WebSocket URL. We can grab the WSS endpoint here and paste that in here. All right, so now we can define the address that we'd like to track. We can do this in a variable called address, and I'll use one of my burner wallets here. Okay, so now we'll need to create our handler function. This will handle the block that gets returned from the filter that we create later. We can call this handle new block and it'll take one parameter called block. We can start with a simple print statement that just essentially conveys that it's received the new block. Uh, new block, and then number. And then this block variable will contain a field called transactions. So what we'll do is loop through each transaction and essentially qualify if that transaction interacts with our specified address. So we can do for TX and block transactions. And now we can write our conditional to essentially qualify if this transaction was either from or to the address that we defined above. So we can do if, first of all, if the to field on the transaction is actually defined, and then we can do and TX to dot lower is equal to address Dot lower. And now we can write the second half of the conditional that essentially copies the first half that accounts for any transactions in which the from field includes the address that we specified. Okay, so at this point, any transaction that is passed through this conditional will either have the from field or the to field be populated by the address that we specified in the address variable. So knowing this, we can just go ahead and print out some information about that transaction. So we'll print out the transaction hash, the from field, the to field, and the value of the transaction. Okay, so now that we've defined our handler function, we can move on to creating the filter itself. Let's do this in a function called pull new blocks. And then in here, we can define the filter in a variable called block filter and do w3.eth.filter. We'll be filtering for the latest block in the blockchain. Below this, we can open up a while true loop. And then in here, we can iterate through all of the entries returned by the filter. We can do that with for block hash in block filter. Now we'll need to run a get block call on each block in the filter. We can define this in a variable called block. And we can do w3.eth.getBlock, then block hash and true. And now all we have to do is call the handler function that we defined above on the block variable. And then we can simply call the pull new blocks function here and see if it works. Let's go ahead and run it. As you can see here, it's getting all of the new blocks as they get confirmed on the blockchain, but there aren't any transactions popping up. Well, it's simply because this is one of my burner addresses and we haven't populated it with any new transactions recently. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually query the Chainstack faucet on this address and see if it pops up in our transaction listener here. So I've grabbed my API key pasted it in here, and I grabbed the address that we're listening to and also pasted it in here. So now I'll click on claim tokens and claim my 0.5 go early ETH. As you can see, the tokens were sent, and there we go. There's the transaction that was sent from the faucet. We have the transaction hash here, the from address, which is the address for the faucet, the to address, which is the address that we're watching here, and the value, which is 0.49 ETH. So there we go. Now the script will continue running forever and essentially watch all transactions coming in and going out from this address. All right, so let's move on to our third and final script. In here, essentially we'll be making a get logs call to retrieve all of the transfer events for mainnet Ethereum USDT in the past 10 blocks. So let's jump right into it. Of course, to start, we'll need Web3. Again, of course, similar to the last two scripts, go ahead and connect to the blockchain. For this script, we'll be using an HTTP endpoint rather than WebSocket like we did last time. And then to fill this in, we can go to Chainstack, head back over to our test three project, click on join network, select Ethereum, and now this time Ethereum mainnet, and in this case, we'll be deploying a globally load balanced Elastic full node. All right, so let's open it up here and copy the HTTPS endpoint here. To start, we can define the contract address. This will be the address of the contract that we're querying events for. In my case, I'm looking for transfer events on USDT. So this is the USDT contract address. We'll also need to define the transfer event signature. And then essentially here, we'll just be converting the raw ERC20 transfer event. All right, so now with our connection defined, as well as our two base variables, we'll need to define our block range. We can first define a variable called latest block. And this will, of course, be set to the most recent block on the blockchain. And then we can also define from block, which will essentially just be the number of blocks back in which we want to find events. So we can do latest block minus 10. This means that in this case, I want to find all of the transfer events within the past 10 blocks. So now with all these variables defined, we'll need to create our filter parameters. So we can save this in a variable called filter params. And we can define from block, which will just be the from block variable that we defined above. We can define to block, which in this case can either be the latest block variable that we defined, or we can just pass in the string latest. We can define the address, which in this case is the contract address variable that we defined above. 
and we can define the topics. This will be the event signature that we're looking for. With our parameters defined, we can just very simply call the get logs method. So we can do that and save it into a variable called logs and then do w3.eth.getLogs and pass in filter params. So perfect. We've now defined all of our parameters, defined the parameter object and pass it into our get logs call. So all we have left to do is iterate through each log in the logs variable and print it out. So we can do for log in logs and then in here, we can just start printing out all the event or transaction information. All right, so as you can see here, I printed out the block number, the transaction hash, the from address that executed the transaction, the to address, as well as the value in USDT, which is of course the token that we're indexing transfers for here. So let's go ahead and run it and see if it works. Oh, looks like I forgot a parentheses right here. All right, let's run it again. And there we go. As you can see, there are plenty of USDT transfers in the past 10 blocks. And of course we can see all the information that we printed out. So the transaction hash, from, to, value, etc. This was episode 16 in Chainstack's bite size building series. You can watch the other 15 episodes just like this one below. And of course, throughout this video, I spun up multiple different Ethereum Elastic nodes. If you'd like to supercharge your dApp and learn more about Chainstack Elastic nodes, then you can also do so through the link below.